I'm Corbett Wall with DV Auction here with your feeder flash for Tuesday, August the 13th, brought to you in part by Legacy Beef Co-op. Legacy Beef will own a portion of Cattleman's Heritage Beef Plant, uh, going to be right near Council Bluffs, Iowa. If you want to get into this cooperative and assure yourself a kill spot, go to LegacyBeefCoop.com for more information. And better yet, at the end of this Feeder Flash episode, watch this video. Uh, it's an interview I had with Chad Tenninger, and, uh, and you can learn more about Legacy Beef Co-op. Also, Beaver County Stockyards in Beaver, Oklahoma, are uh, going to have uh, about 2,500 head for their feeder cattle and, and cow sale, too, on Tuesday here. They're uh, going to start at 7 a.m. like they've been doing and uh, going to have seven to eight hundred calves uh, be a lot of light calves in there only about 25 percent of them will be weaned uh, but there's going to be some nice calves there about 1300 yearlings be about 400 yearling heifers there uh, most of them weighing seven and in, in the sevens and eights there they got one load of a thousand pound yearling heifers there be three or four load lots in that deal then about 900 yearling steers and they've got some real nice ones there uh, Gerald Radcliffe's in there and he's got uh, some steers and they're gonna have some size to them they might weigh close to a thousand there but they're really really top genetics there out of Hoffman Bulls uh, he's gonna have three loads of them uh, there's four loads coming from a, another consigner there that's gonna be almost as, as high in quality there uh, that there's going to be a lot of loads of yearling steers there many many loads of those and they'll all be pretty good uh, most of them all good enough to go anywhere guys but good sell there at Beaver County Stockyards gonna have four to five hundred for the cows 30 or 40 young bred cows uh, in pairs there but most of them will just be way up there but uh, talk about bearish funds my gosh we thought maybe we'd be uh, higher to start the week out on our futures, but these funds are so bearish. And by the funds, I mean the fund managers that are managing other people's invested money, trying to get the best return. And, uh, and they're the only ones, basically, that are ever on the long side of cattle futures. Your industry is always on the short side. They're always hedging something. And then a lot of your small time uh, speculators, of course, they're going to be on the short side too, especially when we're sitting near all-time record highs. But uh, we went from having one of the largest open interests there uh, at the very tail end of July to by the end of the first week of August, uh, your funds had, had liquidated long positions of over 20,000 contracts. I mean, just dumped them. And that's why we saw the big down there early last week. And and we just can't seem to get any of them to get excited about getting on the long side. And you hear me talk about that all the time. We need to offer the long something to entice them to get in and to entice them to stay a while uh, on the long side of the, of the cattle futures there. And the CME is still wanting your opinion on that. Uh, there's a survey there on cmegroup.com. There's a survey you can get on there and take. And it says... Uh, they have some changes in mind, some things they would like to do to change the, the live cattle contract. And get on there and tell them about it. Tell them you want them to see them. Uh, maybe have a cash settlement if you think that's what it is. The hell of it is then, what would be cash settlement? What's the cash price? I mean, our, our, our uh, negotiated trade is getting so thin, I don't know if, if that's enough or not. And it's getting smaller and smaller all the time. So, you know, maybe, but maybe cash settlement is the answer. Uh, I personally think if we allowed your long positions to demand delivery of the cattle when we got into the spot month there and, and that uh, contract had matured, I think we could get some, some regional packers in there. We could get people that have contracts to fill for fat cattle. Uh, we could get people on the long side there and would demand delivery, which would pull that board up. Uh, just like whenever you tend to tender delivery, it sucks it back down a little bit. But we've got to get something to uh, balance this board out. Uh, it's just heavily on the downside, and the entire industry is always on the downside. But uh, it's just uh, 
very frustrating to watch this and we started out the week down of course our, our feeder cattle auctions weren't that bad actually they were higher because we were dealing with our Monday sales that completely tanked a week ago so cooler heads have prevailed now we had a big up day on Friday and feeder cattle were down 210 on Monday but hell that ain't nothing we can handle that uh, we see it down over seven dollars sometimes so uh, you know we, we did see some pretty impressive uh, feeder cattle auctions uh, on Monday and our, our fat cattle wrap up uh, wasn't that bad we lost about three dollars on the live market last week negotiated lost uh, a little over five and a half dollars on the dress market there uh, but it was nothing compared to the topsy-turvy volatile uh, things that were happening on the board last week and if you remember our August live cattle actually ended the week higher uh, than the end of the previous week so that shouldn't have happened but people just get uh, really nervous when they see a big down day like we saw uh, a week ago on Monday and it scares people and then we get fears involved and emotions and things it can definitely uh, you know take its toll on the market but I would say uh, all in all, we're, we're kind of building some confidence back in this thing if the board would just take a hold. But that's asking your fund managers to get on the long side. And I'm not sure if they've got enough confidence to do that or not. I want to tell you all a little story uh, that's going, up, uh, going on up in western South Dakota. And it's over boundary issues. Uh, and it's over our, our public lands, uh, multi-use public lands. Uh, that uh, that your ranchers depend upon and the public lands and the government depends on the ranchers uh, to to uh, to use that together to help manage those lands out there uh, but it's a story about Charles and Heather Maud out there in South Dakota uh, Charles family has had uh, this land uh, they had purchased this land in question here uh, the ranch that they they farm and ranch on in 1910 so it's well over 100 years he's had that. Uh, there was a, a barrier there or a, a fence line that they were using for a boundary. Uh, it was over 75 years old. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden one day here in the last year or two, uh, he had the U.S. Forest Service come in and tell him they wanted him to take down a no trespassing sign that was on all the land, on some of the land that he had always had over near uh, the Cheyenne River breaks there. And uh, he didn't have a problem with that. He took the no trespassing signs down. And then uh, they said that they had a, a difference with him over where the boundary was supposed to be. Well, the boundary was, was in those river breaks there, which uh, it said in the laws, you know, they change over time. Uh, but your boundary was always supposed to stay with them. Well, you know, it's hard telling what's happened, you know, in the last hundred years or what. Well, or what's going on but Charles and Heather have always had permits grazing on BLM there or federal lands and uh, and so you know they felt like that they were well within the rules because they're supposed to oversee that they've got crop ground there that uh, FSA office uh, you know checks out and they, they were always been uh, fine uh, but they come back and Forest Service said uh, that there was a piece of land there that uh, had always been Charles's land or his family's land and all of a sudden they, they claimed the land and he had just recently uh, put pivot irrigation on that piece of land wasn't real excited about just handing it back to him when he, he'd had it all of his life and all of his father's life there and so he decided uh, you know he, he said well we, let's just check it out what do we need to do let's get a survey on it so uh, slow government uh, things happen so they they did a survey on it and uh, it took quite a while but then uh, they come back and all of a sudden uh, the US Forest Service is indicting Charles and Heather separately so they're supposed they're both supposed to lawyer up and neither the the husband and wife or their lawyers are supposed to be able to talk about this case that's coming on but it's it's quite a deal it, it kind of reminds me of Biden's or Magoo's 30 for 30 plan where he uh, had every intention of gaining 30 uh, percent federal ownership of, of the land of the United States by 2030 well you know that Kamala is going to continue uh, that same policy 
And I don't know if, if uh, all of a sudden these different bureaus that manage that land are, are getting uh, greedy and they're wanting to get their hands on as much of it as they can. If there's something in particular they're wanting to do on that spot right there. Uh, but instead of sitting down and talking about it and maybe getting out some plats and maybe looking and seeing what happened with that boundary and why there was a, a difference there, uh, they just indicted them and, and threatened them with federal penitentiary. Uh, you know, that, that seems, uh, it doesn't seem fair uh, for people that have lived there uh, all their lives, raised families, volunteered for the local fire department, and were good stewards of the land like Charles and Heather Maude have been. But uh, I tell you what it has done is it has got all of our cattle trade associations uh, together. Uh, of course, U.S. Cattlemen's Association and RCAF are all on the Maude side and NCBA is even on the Maude side. It's been a long time since I've seen them be on the right side of an issue, but they're getting pretty aggressive there. Of course, they've got the lobbyists that can maybe help them out there, but uh, I'm glad that they are getting some help. There's been a lot of people send letters to Secretary Vilsack's office uh, telling them they need to work with this ranching and farming family there in South Dakota and, uh, and you know, be a little bit more sensible on what's going on. But this story has been pretty widely advertised, and uh, if you guys are interested in it, you can check it out. Let's talk about your board on uh, Monday to start the week out, August live cattle down 92 cents at 183.32. Uh, your your latest uh, weighted average in the five area feeding region on negotiated sales is 191.34. But here we are halfway through August. Uh, contract is pretty much mature, and we're eight dollars under that. Uh, October uh, down 112 at 180.02. Your back months on live cattle down 35 cents to down a buck 10. August feeder cattle down $2.10 at 244.40. I've told you guys, uh, it will meet up with your RTI, or your, not your RTI, but your CME cash feeder cattle index. The hell of it is, that cash feeder cattle index has fallen so fast that it's only about a buck higher than that right now. So, uh, you know, you just, you, you want to kill the feeder market, kill the feeder board which believe it or not is really not that hard to do. September feeder cattle down $2.10 also at $2.39.50. Your back months on feeder cattle down a buck and a half to down $2.05. December corn up six and a half cents a bushel at four oh one and a half. November beans down sixteen and a half at just nine eighty six. So you got corn barely struggling to hold on to four dollars a bushel and now our beans are under $10 a bushel as we start to near harvest. Uh, your farmers are frustrated with that, you know that. Uh, hard red winter wheat uh, for September down five and three quarter cent at 5.48 and a quarter. Your weighted average on last week's negotiated fed cattle trade out of your five very feeding region totaled 61,100 last week compared to 55,900 the previous week and about the same 61,400 the same week a year ago. Live sales of fat steers and heifers negotiated in your five area region, 185 to 194. Uh, pretty good spread there. Uh, that spread had a trend of steady to four and a half dollars lower. Your weighted average on live steers, 191.34. That was down to $3.11 compared to your uh, live steer weighted average from the previous week. Dress trade on fat steers and heifers in the five area negotiated was 294 to 308. You're thinking 294, yeah. There was 181 head that sold at 294, and then the next lowest was three dollars. So it was basically three dollars to 308. But that 294, who the hell did that? Uh, and, but that three dollars to 308 was mostly three to six dollars lower. Your weighted average on dress steers is 30401, down 559 compared to the previous week. As a whole, your Southern Plains market was two dollars lower at 186. Northern Plains market down three dollars for the most part at 193, and dress sales down five dollars at 305. Nationwide, we sold 76,200 head. Uh, 23,600 of those were for the two to four week delivery. 
uh, uh, previous week was 69,600 in the same week a year ago. Nationwide negotiated was 74,100. Last week's negotiated grid was big, as big as I can remember. 51,500 had sold negotiated grid last week. Uh, that's good if you can get some negotiation on the grid, but uh, very little negotiating being uh, done on that uh, negotiated grid unless it's on uh, the Fed Cattle Exchange. Forward contracts were only 5,900 and formula sales 280,300 head. Of the four out of five feeding areas that we get information from, Iowa sold 28,800 negotiated last week. That's about as many as they normally sell. Uh, Nebraska sold 18,200. That's about 10,000 shy of what they would typically do. Kansas sold 8,800 and Texas only 5,200. Box beef cutout values were higher. They've been higher early in the week here. We saw Monday jump big, especially on choice. Choice cuts Monday afternoon were up three dollars and twelve cents at three fifteen eighty three. Selects were up a buck fifty eight at three hundred dollars and seventeen cents. Your slaughter to start the week out very disappointing, only one hundred and twelve thousand. That's seven thousand than the previous Monday, and six uh, less and six thousand less than the same Monday a year ago. Talk about what else is going on. Western video market Cheyenne sale is going on. They had a humdinger uh, on Monday with the yearlings, especially for the way the market is and the way it's acted here in the last week, but uh, uh, still awfully good sale. Uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, really top quotes uh, from the Western video market video sale uh, that was happening in Cheyenne at Little America on Monday. Uh, Shane Caxter there at Bassett uh, Livestock, uh, you know, they have, they have the good sale barns in that in the country out west they're the reps which works really good because then you don't have different reps just running around out there with cameras stepping on everybody's toes if you've got your respectable sale barns repping those cattle in the video sales uh, then they can represent those cattle the best because they've been working with those people the longest so uh, but Shane Caxer was representing three bar cattle company which is southwest of Valentine Nebraska they sold 400 head of 780 pound Red Angus home raised steers, feeder steers there for late delivery. No special programs on, of course, all the shots and everything, uh, but none of those special stamps anywhere. Uh, but 400 head of 780 pound Red Angus steers bring 26350 for late August delivery. I thought that was pretty darn good, uh, as close to 800 pounds as that was. Uh, now we did have a big heifer yearling sale to talk at. Uh, was represented by my friend Rich Robertson there, uh, Crawford, Nebraska. Uh, it was the Hal and Linda Downer cattle, uh, just north of Mitchell, Nebraska, and there was 534 head of 810 pound black spade heifers, and they were purchased cattle, really good quality, but locally purchased cattle there and no special programs on them. Of course, all the shots and everything, but no special programs on them. But 534 head of 810 pound spade heifers bring 252. Wow, I thought that was pretty impressive, guys. Uh, now Tuesday, here today, uh, they are having the calf sale. So get on to, to dvauction.com or get on to WVM Cattle and, uh, and get on that sale. Starts at 8 o'clock mountain time. That'll be 9 o'clock central there. A lot of good calves. A lot of weaned calves on there. And then, of course, uh, your typical unweaned calves there. Uh, starting from the plains and going all the way back west. Uh, just like they typically do. But let's talk about your feeder cattle market uh, for Monday. Your real-time index on DV auction. Based on an 800-pound cash auction steer up through your middle 12 states. Uh, late in the day on Monday, sitting at 246.83, that was 31 cents higher. I told you the markets were better on Monday, but I didn't know if it would make a higher real-time index uh, because uh, it's a seven-day moving average, but it did. Uh, your latest CME cash feeder cattle index lost over $4 uh, and is now sitting at 245.57. Talk about your big high-volume sales on Monday. Oklahoma National Stockyards in Oklahoma City 
had 5,300 cattle. Market was better. Feeder steers two to six dollars higher. Feeder heifers steady to four dollars higher. And calves sold seven to ten dollars higher. Uh, that did include about a thousand head as part of an Angus special there that they had at Oklahoma National Stockyards on Monday. But that's pretty darn good sale. But if you remember uh, last week when the board absolutely crashed, so did the cash market in Oklahoma City. So it came back pretty well. How about Joplin Regional Stockyards? 5,100 there. They were only estimating 4,000. Got 1,100 more than they estimated. A lot of sales be glad to get 1,100. Uh, but feeders sold steady to five bucks higher. And calves, peewee calves, like under 450, uh, the, the heifers were 10 to $15 higher. And the peewee steer calves were as much as 30 bucks higher. They're coming after these lightweights, guys. I thought I would uh, let you see what a market is like. Look at this automated market report through Cattle Market Central. Is your national beef wire stick out sale of the day. It's Joplin Regional Stockyards. Look at your best tested weights, which there's several of them. I left the changes on here on your weighted averages too, and you see how, how impressive they are uh, with big gains there, like I told you on the trends. But 284 head of four weight steers averaged 456, the weighted average price of 308.49. 484 head of five weight steers averaged 552 at 288.01. There was 483 six, six weight steers averaged 648, 275.31. 583 had a seven weight steers average 743 at 25405 and 538 head of eight weight steers averaged 849 with a weighted average price of 23682 in Carthage, Missouri at Joplin Regional Stockyards. Look at the heifers. 295 had a four weight heifers average 450 at 27429. 870 had a five weight heifers averaged 537 at 267.28. 370 had a six weight heifers average 648 or 641 at 245.52 and there was 493 out of the seven weight heifers in Joplin. They averaged 732. Weighted average price 238.73. Uh, talk about the best quote that I saw anywhere on Monday. Your Macrosin no BS. Top quote for the day. Come out of Sioux Falls Regional Livestock in Worthing, South Dakota. It's another DV auction broadcaster. We're proud to be with them. They sell 285 head of 944 pound steers in one swath. And they bring 249.50. That's your feeder flash for Tuesday. I'm Corbett Wall with this feeder flash feature. I'm here with Chad Tenniger from Legacy Beef Co-op and Cattlemen's Heritage. And uh, we're going to give you some information about getting in on the ground floor of a co-op that's going to own part of Cattlemen's Heritage, a new privately owned packing plant. Uh, hopefully, we'll give you an opportunity to stay profitable and stay in the cattle feeding business and compete with the big four packers. How are you doing today, Chad? Good, Corbett. Glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about this... Uh, new and exciting venture that you got going? Yeah, I'd love to. So we started out, Legacy Co-op is an outshoot of Cattlemen's Heritage Beef Company, the new processing plant outside of Council Bluffs. That'll be uh, 525,000 head a year. We'll be processing right outside of Council Bluffs off of the I-29 corridor over there. We've got about 132 acres. We've cleared the land. We're ready to break ground next spring and Legacy Co-op will be the supply of the cattle that will feed that plant that, with the producer involvement. Okay, so all the cattle that come into that plant will be through Legacy Co-op. That is the goal, yes. We wanna make sure that the producer has a say in how the plants run, the say in how the market works. All these things that we as producers, when I put my producer cap on, I wanna get the best value for my cattle. Well, I don't think there's any way I can ever get the best value for my cattle if I don't participate in the processing end of it because obviously in the last decade we've seen very clearly that the only way we're ever going to get what we think we deserve is to actually participate in the ownership okay so you say uh, these these co-op members are going to have a say in what goes on at the plant how is that going to work so how we've set up the co-op is it's buying shares one share is one delivery obligation a year so there's 525,000 shares up for sale 
once you deliver your cattle, what you're going to gain in the beginning is you're going to get access to a grid. Everybody knows how a grid works, premiums and discounts. But our grid is going to be tied to the box beef cutout. We are not going to tie it to the CME. We fundamentally believe that the CME does not represent the cattle fundamentals in the country on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we could all agree to that. There's no, trader, there's no traders in the pits anymore. There's no human contact. It's computer algorithms trading on headlines, and we're at the mercy of it. So beginning, the fundamental belief is let's tie it to the box beef cutout. At least then we know we got a fair shake. You also, if you're a member of the co-op, you get a $25 bonus every time you deliver. So automatically it's $25 more than you would have got anywhere else. And then at the end of the day, for buying into the co-op, that co-op is gonna have roughly, give or take 20% ownership in Cattlemen's Heritage Beef Company. So true ownership in the plant, in the company, in the brand, whatever we can create out of this, you have ownership in and get a margin in those profits. So these unit shares, you, you assume they're going to uh, gain in value as time goes on. Every other company that we've looked at like this in the pork industry, there's more of these companies with producer involvement. All those shares just increase in value. You can sell them. You can, you know, and your kids can inherit them, pass it down. But ultimately, you have a say in how the system works that you're participating in. So you're offering producers an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. Yeah, I've been in this business my whole life, and we as producers, we, my whole life we've been saying, you know, we, we don't have any say in how we sell our product, what comes from it, we're at the mercy of everybody. This is an opportunity to be in the ground floor at the cheapest you're going to get in to actually take ownership in a company that you'll participate in. You know, we've set it up. The Cattlemen's Heritage will have its own board. The co-op will have its own board. They will work together hand in hand in an advisory board. Each board will have two members of the other. So we have true ownership in the game. So when we talk about how are we gonna sell cattle or how's the grid gonna work exactly, you're gonna have a seat at the table with us deciding those very things. So the plan itself, you're expecting to pretty much run on a consistent margin then and then, then the extra money is gonna be premiums for the producer? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty simple system. You tie a grid to a set point. We're going to tie it to the box beef cutout. Then you have to plant production. You can't break the plant, right? It's got, it costs X amount to run. You minus that out, and then you start on quality of cattle. You're still going to be paid for quality cattle on a premium discount basis. That would be very similar to how a grid works today. Mm -hmm. One thing we are looking at pretty closely that we might change, you know, when, especially when you get discounts on fours and fives. Right. In today's world, in reality, there is not really much of a discount on a four. Yeah. And what's heading coming up that a lot of people probably don't realize, but 45Z, it's a huge tax credit that's coming on the tax code for anything biofuels. That's what all the ethanol industry is doing. That's what they're talking about. That's why they're paying you. Well, our fats and towels and the cattle are worth gold right now going to the biodiesel. And we're not getting a part of that. And there's going to be yet another revenue stream that we won't see. So, you know, when you start adding up all the value adds that we as producers do, that we don't participate in, at a certain point in time, all of us producers are just saying, I'm doing the most I will do to create value that I don't get to participate in. So we talked about the cattle. What kind of cattle are you looking for? We're just really looking for northern, western genetics, right? That's going to be the cattle. The kind of cattle we feed where we are. If you take a, if you put a pin in Council Bluffs, that's where the plant will be. You go 300 miles in any direction, that's a lot of high quality cattle. And so we're not going to limit it to just black hide it or anything like that. It'll be just all quality cattle, because the system's still set up. You deliver quality, you'll make more money. Okay, so no particular program. Yeah. It's just where you're where you're at on the globe, that's the kind of cattle you want. That's exactly Island right. type cattle. Yeah, and the system will work that if somebody thinks they're gonna deliver really bad cattle, the, the, the negatives will still be them. there. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't work. It, it still functions the same. And within that, over time, again, Will there be programs that maybe develop like anything does? There could be. If there's more value at the end, of course, why wouldn't we bring it back into the plant? And then again, the co-op will own 20% of the plant, so it's a true dividend at the end of the year. So are you looking at, at Cattlemen's Heritage having a, a retail label? Yeah. Okay. So. so the end goal is create a brand. So we've talked a lot about the last three years. We're three years into due diligence of this plant. That's why we're so confident in where we are today. What we've discovered is the, cat, <clears throat> the cattle industry has done the worst job ever of telling its story of its greatest asset, and that's the farmers and ranchers and producers. We have all these amazing men and women working every day in this industry. We don't tell their story. Right. You know, so we're going to tell the story. Our marketing is going to be, 
you know, look at these family farmers, look at the ranchers, look at what they do every day. When they don't do a good job, they lose farms. They lose their livelihood. So you better believe if anything in the world of doing the best quality for what you're putting on your kitchen table, it comes out of our farmers and ranchers. How are you going to compete with the big four? So there's a couple ways. We have done three years of due diligence to figure out why plants don't work when they don't work. What causes a failure, right? Undercapitalized, we have the capital. Bad location, that I cannot overstate having a bad location. We're outside of Council Bluffs, there's a million people right outside that door. That, so we have plenty of work. The other thing we look at is, how do you compete? That's the question, right? How do you compete? Well, the co-op will be a supply of cattle, that's a bunch of producers that have signed up to deliver cattle because they want to share in the upside profits. So on the front side, you can't outbid the cattle. Those cattle are already committed, they're coming in, and they're committed because they're gonna get rewarded better. Mm -hmm. So we know we'll have the cattle supply coming into the plant. Then selling the beef, what we found over the last three years is, as frustrated as we get as producers that we can only really sell to a handful of companies, on the retail side, there's a lot of frustration on that end too that they only get to buy from a couple of companies. So we've been contacted by over 80 companies to buy beef today. But at this point, you haven't gone into partnership with any uh, prospective customer. We haven't point. yet, but we're finalizing some of that. We will have a, a major partner on off. I think you need to. And we will, we're working through that. So what we wanted to make sure is, A, do we have the capital to build? Can we build the right plant, a highly efficient plant? Are we in the right location? Once we cleared all those hurdles, that's a big part of what a retailer, an end user wants to know too. Sure. You guys have all your ducks in a row, so when we're ready to buy meat. So before we break ground, we'll have a major partner signed up to buy the product. Another way that we've done that we feel is really important is these old plants, they're old, they're tired, they're inefficient. They started by you know processing 2,000 head a day, they're doing 5,000 head a day. Right. And you know there's plants in this country that you know, if you built them today, might have two forklifts and they got 36 running around that plant, things like that. The way we've designed it with new technology, proven technology, our technology came out of Europe, New Zealand, and Australia. And the reason we're doing that is they hit their labor issues 20 years before we did. So in a world where labor's tight, especially in this industry, you gotta be as efficient as you can. We will process 2,000 head a day. A typical plant takes uh, 1,200 employees to do that. We'll have 800. Wow. 400 less employees, that translates to 25 million a year in savings to the plant, which transfers $50 a head, cheaper production cost. So our plant will operate at a cheaper per head production cost than any plant in the system. Wow. And that's where you get the margin. So when you start thinking about how they're gonna squeeze you out, well, they'd have to start losing $100 a head where we start breaking even. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part of this that we looked at again it's not that complicated to say, I'm gonna go build a plant and then just go throw one up somewhere. What's complicated is be successful. Right, and I assume you've got your team pretty well set because you've got to have people that have experience in this kind of stuff because it's, it's a tough business. Yeah, we get asked that a lot and that's a really important question and I make sure everybody knows today, I'm the head of the company, I will not be running a plant. That is not my expertise. <laughs> I've never claimed to be that guy. But what we will do is, the beauty of what's happening in the system is because there's just a few companies that really have the top guys out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of people retire 56 to 60 out of that world and there's a lot they're of people, they're not even close to done. Right. There is so much talent in this space that's there to available. We've identified it, we've hired advisors from day one. So I have an advisor that his entire job is just to identify that talent and make sure that when we open our doors, we have the right talent in place. Because there's another way, if you wanna fail, just don't put the team together. You know, try and save money on your management team. That's a great way to fail. So, you know, we're looking for some for, for some new uh, co-op members. And uh, how much risk do you think there is involved in this? What we've done is we went two and a half years and we talked to producers and got all their point of views and heard every comment we could talk about. And at the end of the day, we developed this program we're in today. And this is the final program we're going out. So what it is, there's various stages of the co-op membership. You are rewarded to get in early. The first round, there's five rounds. The first round is $125 a unit. It goes up $25 every round. It's split pretty evenly through the rounds. So 
that that's not a huge investment in the cattle world today. No, that's especially the prices we're at now. <laughs> the way it is today. How it works is right now it's $25 down. So if you want to buy a unit today, it's $25 down. Okay. That holds your spot. Then we're going to come out in end of the year, right at the end of the year with the final, here's your final agreement, sign up. If you decide at that point in time, you know what, something's changed, I don't want in on this, we'll refund $15. we got to keep 10 because we spent 10 to put the system together. So all you're really putting at risk today is 10 bucks. 10 bucks a unit, and if you don't like it at the end, your 15 comes home. If you do like it at the end, before we break ground, roughly 30 days before we break ground, the balance of it will be owed. I, we made it as simple as we could. To be honest, when we first started this, I was hoping to have the producers own 60, 70% of this. Mm -hmm. We found there's not a lot of appetite for that because that, then you're talking five, six, $700 a unit. Mm -hmm. I understand that, that's a lot of money. Well, it sounds to me like you're not really looking at this co-op to to give the bulk of your capital to build this Absolutely plant. Not. You're you're ready to build the plant. You're just giving folks opportunity to to get into the supply of the cattle. The plant's going to get built no matter what because what we've done in two and a half years is we've found the debt, we found the equity, we're working on all these pieces of the pie. We've got the MPAP award from the USDA, which is the largest, the 25 million you can get from that to build more packing industry, right? So we've been working on all these pieces. At the end of the day, the 100 million, roughly, if you sell 520,000 units, that's come from producers, but that's a 500, and, it's a $500 million plant. So that's where you get your 20% ownership, give or take, it's a true equity play. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's the passion of it. The producers need to get involved so we have the final say in the outcome also. Anybody that's in the cattle industry should be in this. And I tell bankers, I've talked to a lot of bankers, there's not a cattle feeder that I know that shouldn't take this opportunity. When you think about what it costs, if you return $25 a head, just on, you know, it, once a year, it gets one space, but that's five years, your initial investment's back just off of that, and then you've risked nothing. Right. It, it's a low risk maneuver that opens up a top end. So we did a lot of data mining to find out what, how the math works. In the last decade, if you just take an average of how the industry has worked in the past, box beef versus what an average would be is about 61.3% of the box beef cutout is where the industry has averaged in the past. From In fact, from 04 to 13, that was exactly what it averaged, 61.3. If you take that same number extended to today for the last 10 years, you'll find between what we sold our cattle for and what the packer had at 61.3, there's $206 on every animal of a margin that we didn't participate in. So I've heard a big pushback I've had is, well, if you're gonna give the producer all the money, the pack goes broke. Well, I'm here to tell you, the numbers don't lie. You can do the data mining yourself and figure it out. There's $206 on every head we sold in the last decade on average that we didn't participate in that margin. I'm not saying it's all ours as producers. I'm just saying there's a buffer there that certainly there's a middle ground we should all partake in. Right, right. We've been told our whole lives, you do it our way, you don't get paid at all. Now we're sitting here saying, if you, if you do it, if we create more value, we're gonna pay you for it. Well, Chad, thanks for all the information here about Legacy Beef Co-op and Cattlemen's Heritage. If folks are, are interested in making an investment or finding out more about this, where should they go? Best place to go would be go to LegacyBeefCoop.com or Cattlemen'sHeritage.com. Either one will give you a link to go here to get the information. Okay. Well, I appreciate all the information today and, and enjoyed the visit. Thank you.